there's a part of this that it isn't hypothetical. Like, people, you're gluing yourself to a wall in a country who is living out the logical conclusions right now of the thing that you're calling for. Like, honor the complexity of the geopolitical economic system in your mathematics of wanting to make cultural change. Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. And I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I've been wanting to talk to you about using art and activism and protest for a long time, and particularly the whole like combining it with gluing yourself to things, which has happened with some frequency in the past several months. But yet again, we have another one. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, there's another one. But this one, I don't know. It kind of floated to the top of the news sources again, the whole throwing uh, tomato soup at the Van Gogh sunflowers and then gluing to the wall and then the ensuing protest that broke out in Scotland Yard um, by the activist group Just Stop Oil. And then, um, yeah, so there, there are all kinds of ways that I think this is potentially sort of funny slash like eye rolling. Um, and maybe we'll get to some of those, but I want to take this in the direction of why attacking art or like why using art as the stage mm -hmm. is or isn't a good idea. Uh, well, I don't think it is a good idea. My In my ideal world, you most people listening to this will have seen pictures of like people with like their hand glued to the wall and the Just Stop Oil t-shirts and the, you know, the artwork with tomatoes on it or something. I'm really waiting for some art gallery to like punk this by like, okay, the protester glues their self to the wall and then you take the the painting off the wall and go clean it and then hang up another one. It's like some kind of like snarky caption of like, this is what the youth today are up to with like an arrow pointing to the people glued to the wall and you just leave them there <laughs> for like two days and turn them into the art exhibit. I think that would be like a really wonderful artistic experiment. But anyway, all that aside, you know, you and I were looking at an article out of the Atlantic from a art security guy and consultant, which I found to be like a totally fascinating world. Uh, I guess all the heist movies necessitate that we need people like that in the world. And like the extreme measures that they go to to protect art and then the limits of that, we can get into some of that. But um, he said that he thought people attack art because it's kind of a soft target. It's easy to get to and there aren't going to be a ton of consequences. That seems to me like a misread. I think hmm. uh, there's something else going on there, like using famous art to get attention. That captivates our imagination in a different way than something else and so it's that like that there there is something very I, I guess this idea of like something having global intrinsic value or western we could say at least intrinsic like for some reason art does that remember when isis was like smashing like millennia old artwork and religious symbolism and stuff and mm -hmm. a lot of people were like not cool um what is it about art that works well for protesting or that, that that draws international attention in such a unique way. That's a very good question, and I. But I just want to point out that the first the first funny question that went through my head was: Was it a Campbell's can of soup? Was it Campbell's <laughs> soup? <laughs> Whose soup was this? Because that would have been clever. <laughs> yes, yes. Andy War throw Andy Warhol into the mix while you're at it. Yeah, I think there are different categories here. So. ISIS was involved with the destruction of what would what we would call sacred art, mm -hmm. art attached with you know with religious significance to it. That carries massive symbolic weight, obviously. And so when you destroy that, that is an act of desecration. It's an act of conquest, often as well, and it certainly was with ISIS. And that sends a very clear message. Also, it's a form of cultural imperialism, right? We're saying mm -hmm. my my culture is superior to yours. We will desecrate and destroy your sacred objects. Which plenty of that so happens that. in the Old Testament. So, I mean. Absolutely. That, this is part of well, human yes, history absolutely. there. So we're not picking on ISIS, except we are. But it's a type of a thing not unique to them. Right. And that's, a, no, this is something that's been going on for since, you know, the dawn of time. But here, I don't think that's what's happening here necessarily. And I agree with you, Nathan, that I don't think that the security consultants, I don't know what his precise job title is, but yeah, 
He does a lot. He says he divides his time evenly between consulting for museums and developing. So he's probably more of an engineer developing high tech systems that are equipped to protect museums. Mm-hmm. Then they have to. They've got an the article that we're reading adept. and referencing there is this guy says it's extremely hard to protect a painting against a can of soup. So even with a lot of right. technology. Um, but anyway. Right. Right. And I and I had not taken into account the fact that, of course, museums are very vulnerable to hackers. So they have to go through all sorts of extra steps to prevent that. But here, I'm not sure that it's necessarily just the publicity stunt aspects. So certainly, well, that's this what has I'm garnered wondering. national yeah. attention. Yeah. So in a sense, if that was all, if that was the goal, it's worked, right? Here we are, you and I, two lowly podcasters discussing the said stunt and it made it all the way into the pages of the Atlantic. So sure, but it strikes me that there's something more going on here. And this has to do with one of the major critiques of aesthetics and well, really the, the high arts sometimes, or the fine arts, the institution of the fine arts museum would be a prime example of the fine arts. So usually different people categorize the fine arts Dif- you know, have different labels here, but usually that would include painting, sculpture, poetry. Some people get a little bit more expansive, you know, cinema. Some people get more expansive and they would add architecture in there as well, even though there's a high degree of functionality to architecture. I don't want to get too, ac- yes, fashion. I don't want to get too academic here, but yes, yeah, so the, the fine arts, one of the critiques of the fine arts is that this is something that sometimes takes our focus off of justice, right? So instead of caring for the world, instead of paying attention to the very serious disasters and ecological crises that demand our attention, we're standing in a museum contemplating this art and we're turning our back on our actual responsibilities. So some forms of social criticism that come art's way, so to speak, have to do with the fact that it can serve as an impediment to justice. Does okay, that make well, sense? Yeah. So so here, like, all right. Yes, I like that idea. And I hadn't been aware of that critique of the fine arts. But that then does show the strategy of this type of protest where you say, we're going to bring to our percept we're going to bring our perception of the brokenness and the disaster of the world into your sanctuary of fine art to right. rupture the bubble of this dichotomy um so in the sense that that is true then it's a more thoughtful protest than many of us would well and that's me trying to be they said as much well they said as much didn't they? i mean wasn't their message something along the lines of you know you care so deeply about all of this art Right. What's more valuable, that, art or life? Right. But you do care about the actual life of the planet. And, you know, time is, again, it's worth stepping aside here and saying that obviously climate activists are motivated by a high degree of urgency, usually. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's a thinking, the thinking is a little bit more apocalyptic. Time is running out. We need to get the public's attention. And that's this is where, by the way, Mr. Security Guard, whose name escapes me right now, we'll just call him Dr. Security. So this is where Dr. Security had, I did think it had some incisive thoughts because he basically said, we have to talk a little bit about how they protect the art here. Yeah, it's really darn hard to protect, you know, a painting from somebody throwing soup at it. He did point out that some of the paintings have a tiny, almost imperceptible to the naked eye glass case that fits over and this one did and just stopped oil researched that and made sure that they weren't actually damaging it so there's that right so they were quite so there was a a heavy amount of discretion that that actually undergirded this act of protest right or (laughs) vandalism whatever you want to call it but so but not all of the paintings are protected like that some of them if you have to you have to they can't well you have to modify the frame first of all and if you do that some of the frames were chosen by the painters themselves. So if Monet chose the frame, you don't really want to damage the frame to put glass casing over the painting. Others, this one was interesting. If if it's a chalk-based 
mm-hmm. painting, or pastel, the, the yeah. glass, the static electricity tends to draw the, gl- the the chalk out and damage the painting itself. So they can't mm-hmm. always do that. But so my point here is, why am I bringing all the, all of those details up? Well, Doctor Security thinks that possibly this will escalate. That there's there are degrees here. So right now they're making sure that the glass casing is on the painting and that they don't damage in this in this case it was who was the who was the painting by this time it was a it was van gogh Gogh. so i mean you're talking about a very you know very very valuable painting but he thinks what's to prevent some activists from basically trying to go to get more radical with their protest i think he's right (laughs) i think that's highly likely i I liked his idea where he said like the value of art is it being seen, even though it has phenomenal value. And he said, like a bank doesn't take a big bag of like thirty million dollars and hang it on the wall that everybody can walk up to it and look at. Right. And so I've never thought about it like that before. That this was a idea really of like good you're taking your most value valuable asset and making it publicly available is an and hanging it on the wall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> extremely difficult <laughs> yeah. security concern there. Um, and he also said that there are pieces of art, and this is a, a interesting distinction too that like their monetary value isn't what makes them the most vulnerable because some are symbolic in their value that an attack on symbolic art would have more of a, a cultural shift than like a, a rarity or the who the who the painter was, or the artist was so those yeah that's pretty complex little um yeah that was a fun rabbit trail for me to go down of looking at how art needs to be available but how difficult it is so we're talking about vulnerability here um yep. essentially of valuable things which again from the environmental activist stance i think that's exactly uh i think we've made our case here that using art for this type of protest is not just that if you're going to do a protest and i'm not i, I like mitch hedberg i'm against protest but i don't know how to show it great comedian line there <laughs> um that you can say this is a terrible idea, but if this was the mindset you're doing, it's a very strategically excellent way to go about getting attention and the symbolic value of it is very high. So I, on one hand, would love to just dismiss it as a bunch of people with pink hair gluing themselves to walls and laugh it off. Um, on the other hand, it, it, but the fact that it is good, like that's where I want us to go with this of, uh, of are we then assigning in a in a secular culture, does art become the sacred thing? I guess. Uh, so oh, you, you said, you know, is like, oh, you know, so ISIS smashing artwork from Nineveh, that's bad because that's mm-hmm. sacred. There's there's something different about like a Van Gogh, like so. For example, if um, activists glue themselves to Marmite factories, like most of the world doesn't care because most of us don't even think Marmite is sure. a good idea. Um, Apologies to the British people who love Marmite. Um, but, you know, like it doesn't have the same international like <gasps> to it as. But why do we have that for Van Gogh? Or or mm-hmm. why do the fine arts have a universal, a universally treasured feel to them? Yeah, well, before we get there, I'm not yet will. I want to play devil's advocate a little bit here. And let's just state firmly for the record, I do not condone this type of stunt or this type of protest. And I am a big fan of art. I am in favor of the arts. So I'm when it comes to the arts, this is going to be a I'm clash. for them. I'm favored. Yeah. And yeah, I don't think. <laughs> is Campbell's that a little frilly toothpick reference there? Were you making yeah. a Mitch Hedberg? How do you feel about frilly toothpicks? I'm for them. How does Cameron feel about I'm art? I'm for them. Yes. For I was All right, great. trying to match your, your Hedberg references there. But let's play devil's advocate a little bit here, okay? So let's say you're deeply concerned about the environment and you think the ecological disasters are so severe that time really is running out and you're trying to find a way to make people aware and spread that awareness. So that alone, I think you could say that there's there's some legitimacy to doing this. What I think is interesting is that, so Dr. Security, try try not to smile when I say that, Dr. Security had another interesting thought here, which I thought, yeah, I think is, is worth throwing in the mix. He said, look, 
protesters. When you do this kind of thing, you're actually hurting your allies. I mm -hmm. thought this was really interesting. And he speculated, and I don't think unfairly or without reason at all, that most of the staff of a given fine arts institution are probably a little bit more liberal and they're sympathetic to your cause. Yeah. <laughs> in their politics. Right. They're sympathetic to your cause. They care deeply about the environment. And he speculated that, so this stunt alone may mean that your average museum has to shell out 100000 extra dollars for security now. Per and year that's for diverting, years. That's $2 right. bucks. And so that's diverting money away from, yeah, educational funds. That's And so, which he said, and I thought, again, good argument. He said, you may not see that as hugely important, but that actually, you know, is very harmful to the the country to our social environment if you're you know inhibiting our educational institutes so i thought that was i thought that was a good response to the his question. name is his name is steve keller by the way Doc, dr security has a real name it's steve keller <laughs> okay <laughs> steve keller all right i think people are going to prefer my name for him but oh yeah let's keep going with that but yeah so i just i did want to i did want to point point that out yes but your question is really fascinating and i think we should probably spend some good some good time discussing whether okay the arts tell me what tell me what part of my question was fascinating well the fine arts are are they essentially sacred sacred are they a substitute for the sacred sacred in our culture and i think i mean i'm only i think we scratch the surface of that and maybe literally just think out loud about that because there there's a great deal probably that could be said on that subject okay certainly yeah, you go let, ahead. Let man. me start with what I make my case because yeah, I've in various talks and things referred to nature and fine art as two of the modern um, things that we highlight and elevate as that give us the ability to connect with something bigger than ourselves without demanding any moral action in response, and so fine art and nature both give us that sense of like, Oh wow. Like it gives, it gives us a sense of awe and appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a collective recognition of that, that connects us with each other. Think of the, the books and the PhDs and the articles and the museums and the kind of the, the cultivation uh, the curation of collective things that we hold to be valuable that cross, um, all sorts of boundaries that would otherwise be there. So I think, yeah, I've, I've thought of, and this is not to say that they're bad. I just think that we we're we're expecting more of them in a more secular age, perhaps even than we did in the past. So I think sacred isn't the right word there, obviously, but cultural signifiers or unifiers uh, at least. Well, there is some, so the most powerful critic of all time is time itself. And so when you have works of art that survive the ravages of time, because there are many artists right now in our day who are celebrated, they get fellowships, they get, they're highly decorated, and, you know, several years from now, nobody will remember them. And that's true of every mm -hmm. single century. It's true of every decade. But those who do survive and the circumstances of their survival are often, I mean, it doesn't hinge on artistic genius alone. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I mean, there's an extraordinary convergence of circumstances. The right people have to know the right people, all the right institutions have to be lined up, all of this stuff. But once that happens, when you have those survivors, it, they are incredibly precious because if they've survived the ravages of time, they have in them a trace of the timeless. Now, do they still bear the stamps of their age? Of course they do. So if you read Charles Dickens's novel Bleak House, you're going to great you're going to gain a whole lot of insight into the politics of his day, some of the major social issues. Now, if you do only that, you're going to operate with a very reductive understanding and you'll lose the beauty that's in the novel. And also similarly with a Van Gogh, nobody had ever looked at peasants the way this man had before and painted them the way he had before. Van Gogh managed to capture the beauty 
in the most, what people had formerly thought of as the most ordinary and mundane moments and shown, he had showed how they are shot through with beauty and significance. All right. So that's something incredibly precious. So I think that's where it touches on that notion of the sacred. When the authority of the church wanes or is absent entirely, as a, as a society is, you know, is, you know, as we, we see these days, then when you have these little traces of timelessness that most people recognize in some, in some, you know, shape or form, then it does have this kind of, it is imbued with this power, this outsized kind of power. So targeting something like that could be a, an incredibly powerful and destructive gesture. But also, again, you can see why some people would, constr- now I think this is a false dilemma, and I think this is a false way to construe it, but how some people would say, yes, but these institutions of, the arts of high, you know, the high, you know, the fine arts, all of, all of these different modes of thinking are symbols of decadence because they turn your focus away from injustice. They turn your focus away from your responsibilities as a human being and a citizen. You need to actually be working at saving the world, saving the planet, rather than sitting around in a museum and mooning, you know, in front of paintings. Well, okay. So, so yeah, I think right. there's, there are a lot of those factors there too. That's that that's actually really wise and helpful. I like that timelessness and connecting with that in time. And yeah, good stuff there here. So here's the thing, the, the logical fallacy at play. And this is one that I try to teach my children from a very early age. Um, it gets you out of the truth or dare game is the fallacy of the false dilemma. And so this whole thing of what, what do you value more? life or art or you know the environment or art i think a lot of people are like "Eh, that's a little simplistic there um you know of is is there or like Mm -hmm. fine art distracts you from injustice Uh, like really uh you know is there is so some of it is like i think that's when you get into the phase of extremism right when you Mm -hmm. see that these are extremely simple options in your mind it's either this or this uh, mm-hmm. th- that's, that's the bedrock. That's the foundation of extremism. Um, yeah. and I think most people aren't willing to go there yet. And the statistics play that out, even on like how much more are people willing to spend on the cost of heating in order for environmental, re- like it's low, like our, our, our felt economic <laughs> buy-in on some of these ideas is extremely low. Uh, and so you have, and by the way, just stop oil gets like most of their funding from an foundation based in san francisco so we can't say like oh this is you know a british thing now this yeah, mm-hmm. it's, sure. it's it starts here um but i i guess the the thing that happens then is that like fine art really points to like beauty and complexity um and so that idea that you have a van gogh capturing the peasant the sunflowers like there's a lot going on there and, and showing us meaning in that um yeah th- like we can celebrate that on the other hand, like the global economy and use of petroleum is also an extremely complicated thing. And mm-hmm. their goal of getting England to start divesting in oil exploration and new oil leases, that's an experiment that we're in the middle of right now. This is not a new idea. So what happened when Britain stopped pursuing fossil fuels? Guess what? Now Russia is the main player. Yeah on the continent for controlling the temperature of your house and Saudi Arabia is now kind of giggling at the U S. So now you have Saudi Arabia and Russia in charge of (laughs) massive energy resources for millions of people and struggling economies and people at economic risk. And we're watching the whole thing play out right now. So Mm -hmm. even if like there's a part of this that it isn't hypothetical, like, People, you're gluing yourself to a wall in a country who is living out the logical conclusions right now of the thing that you're calling for. Like, honor the complexity of the geopolitical economic system in your mathematics of wanting to make cultural change. So, I, I, I don't know. That's like not fine art, but it's the complexity of reality that also needs to be factored in to, um, <laughs> or else you end up getting what you pay for. 
Yeah, and I think why 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 destructive though? See, that's the other question I have. There are every, there's so much there's so much value of, to what you just said. So I want to add a little bit onto that in a second. But this I don't I want to catch this little loose floating idea in my head before it floats away. So here it is. What why 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 a destructive publicity stunt? Breaking, you know, breaking down art or something. Why not? I mean, creating some kind of some work of art. Uh, you know, yeah, there's but a see, but that doesn't make the news. I mean, all well, kinds of it could though. all kinds of art gardens yeah, but and projects could. and art around cities and you could go graffiti and mural in, on the side of something that's beautiful, but it's not going to show up. Sure. I don't know. No, that's you're right. And that's you're right. This is well, this is a much this is a way to expedite it. It's let's face it, destruction is way easier than creation. No, oh, yeah, that's a whole thought. If yeah, that's a whole thought. But look, if you get a skilled artist, I mean there's a rich tradition of protest art as well, and there are mm-hmm. some very good examples of rich protest art for causes of justice. So why not commission and not you know a really powerful, creative, compelling work of protest art, and I mean, in other words, you can you can do this by going through the right channels, so to speak. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be an act of vandalism. It doesn't have to be a, an act of pure destruction. Just an idea, you know. And that could be a more constructive way to gain to gain a hearing, of course, but. Well, okay. But I, so I digress, so, of course. Yeah. So, well, no. This this is this is good. This all right. Now I have other loose floating thoughts, and it goes like this. There's there's oh, two. Okay. So there's room for. Um. I kind of felt this way about the new atheist of like, okay, I see that you want to tear something down, but give me a better alternative first. Right. Yeah. And and there's like you're not giving any viable alternative to answering a lot of the biggest life questions that are necessary out there. So gluing yourself to the wall, give me an alternative. Like what's the other thing that I should be doing instead of destroying this, create the other thing and invite me into it. That, that whole like second half of that movement doesn't seem to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that, you know, rebels don't make good leaders usually in that sort of thing, or the people who are good at gluing themselves to the walls usually don't turn out to be the best people for how to construct something on the other side. So I th- I think that's like, I'm not against uh, s- civil disobedience or like, or, or criticizing things or, but if you're not pointing to something that's an actually mm-hmm. better viable option, a vision. what are you doing? You need a vision. Yeah. 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 Like there's no, vi- yeah, I don't see the vision on the other side of some of this. So that's where I'm kind of like, Hmm. And also here's something now here's a really interesting point and this does riff off of what you were saying earlier about the beauty of great art it does not lend itself well to propaganda this propaganda you know usually there are hmm. there there are always exceptions and we need to do a we we would have to do a whole separate podcast on this but Lenny Riefenstahl's The Triumph of the Will would be an exception i think that is an appalling vision because this is a the vision of the triumph of the will is the third reich and nazism Mm -hmm. and but it's nevertheless a very powerful work of art in the sense that it's incredibly well executed it is a major feat of cinema both those things are true so there are weird exceptions to this but usually speaking art doesn't lend itself well to propaganda or simplified messages because art gives you a vision of life in all of its glorious complexity. That's what makes art special. It doesn't simplify the world. It helps. It gives you a deeper insight into the richness and wildness of the world. And because of that, if you have a simplified kind of political stance or message, and that's just sort of the driving force behind everything that you're doing, yeah, great works of art will will mess with you because they just they don't they don't take reductive views of the world. Sometimes you have these political visions that are incredibly simplified in order to maintain their intense focus. But again, life as it's actually lived between human beings is shot through with complexity and ambiguity and great works of art capture that. So 
the way I put it when it with regard to literature, for instance, the great subject of literature really is what it means to be a person. I mean, that's really at the heart of literature. What is it like to be a human being? And it's never settled because that question is a mystery in the sense that we can gain insight into it. We are, after all, human beings ourselves, but it exceeds our full comprehension. We'll never get to the bottom of it. So it's not like you're going to read Homer or Virginia Woolf and Shakespeare, and now it's all settled. You have it all figured out. <laughs> and now I don't, you know, I'm, I've, I've, you know, I've exhausted the subject of human nature and human experience. No. I mean, literature, great art continues because great works of art, great artists have somehow managed to capture a vital aspect, not all of it, an aspect of human experience. And it always evades our full grasp. And so I think that's another way. Art is unruly in that sense. You can't, I mean, by dissecting it or being incredibly destructive, you can torture it into maybe, you know, being your ally and make, making it sort of preach your message. But you can only do that at the cost of truncating it or or doing yeah. violence to it, which is what we saw here. Yeah, So, but it also means that there isn't a distinction between life and art. Right. So which would you rather have, life or art? Um, oh, no, absolutely. So I really agree with you there. I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing to point out because you're, you're also assuming that when somebody goes into a museum, nothing is happening and they're doing nothing. That's, oh, right, yeah. That's, I would say that's entirely false. So first of all, do you, now, do you have to go to a museum to, to get your, you know, a dose, a good dose of beauty? Well, no, not necessarily, but you do need beauty. You actually, beauty is nourishment for your soul. This is Frederick Buechner and he's right. Mm. You actually, I mean, this, there's a reason why, even if you go into some of the poorest districts, I remember reading an article on this on some of the slums in one of the the sort of the Indian villages, but how this this person who was an artist noticed that you know these shacks, these people who had so little, there were still people who were keeping gardens there. Mm -hmm. Now, why were they doing that? I mean, were they, are they wasting their time? Shouldn't they just be spending all of their energy on survival? But that is part of their survival. Yeah. I mean, you actually flowers in your garden is part of your survival. And so there so the notion that you're just wasting your time turning your back on all your responsibilities and turning a blind eye to injustice if you, you know, you know, it's either justice or the arts. It's really a mis a very misguided way of looking at human beings and how we actually function. Is creating beauty an act of rebellion against destruction? I hadn't thought about it in those terms. I'm not exactly sure of my question. It just seems like there is a bit of a a rebellion I don't in the think construction would... of the beauty. Like, because, well, so I was thinking of that idea. I had a book. I can't, I don't know where it's at, right? Uh, the War Gardens book. I think you and I looked at it one, like years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's amazing. Super that's fascinating. gripping, fascinating. Yeah. You, if you're listening to this and you're remotely interested, look that up. Um, it's a whole book on the images of the gardens that people formed in ghettos and in war zones and people trying to grow celery in the trenches in France, uh, like, like really hard. And then like them destroying the plants when they're being occupied. So other people can't benefit from their beauty and some really wild psychology in that, but like something in human nature of like creating, like painting the beautiful peasant in their poverty. Mm -hmm. Like how yep. does that, and I'm thinking Christianly here now, kind of that that theme okay. of pointing toward the beautiful, calling out the vision of the good, yeah. honoring the brokenness and complexity, but then having a vision that it's not right and there's something that positive that can be said about yeah. Like it seems like there's a tension there. Yes. And I don't know that I would use the word rebellion, although I think that makes sense given what you're saying. I think it's it's more an act of stubborn hope. Hmm. or just hope, period, in the face of what appears to be hopelessness or despair, especially in some of those circumstances. And even by painting the peasant, the person who in their society or their culture is regarded as insignificant 
And sometimes, you know, even even worse than that, by doing that, you're actually the artist is in the here's the Christian idea is honoring their humanity, Mm -hmm. giving voice to that. And also, you you might say, is pointing to the fact that this this person is made in the image of God. So that's that's a way of that's a way of honoring. That's a way of actually putting us in touch with the reality that we are the deeper reality that we miss in our you know the hustle and bustle of our lives the lies of our culture every culture has its own set of lies every culture has its its myriad ways of devaluing certain people and certain occupations this happens i mean we have our own believe believe me here in the west we don't may we may not call them peasants, but we have people. We there is still we're still hierarchical. We still have subtle class distinctions that we oper, often operate with, and we still view certain people in certain cas, categories as peasants. And so, part of so I think yeah, capturing the beauty and the humanity of people who through various forms of injustice and and violence end up getting conscripted into those categories categories and marginalized but helping uh, helping people to see the full humanity honoring them is a deeply christian gesture and a very powerful act of hope and yeah you might actually you know you might be able to say rebellion or or, or protest but i like the ho- i like the word hope more cuz it's more constructive it's more i robust. like your stubborn hope yeah oh yeah. okay so final question here and this is a big can of worms, so hopefully you can do this concisely. But you're saying that there's a critique of art in that it kind of just distracts us from injustice. Mm. We're talking about a stubborn hope of casting a vision that's possible. There's also been the critique of Christianity that it gives us a distraction away from the injustices and the brokenness of this earth and and, and mm-hmm. takes our vision to the future, and therefore it's bad because it's just kind of a... That, so I'm looking at yeah. kind of like the environment fine art distinction versus the brokenness and justice of the world and the and the stubborn vision of hope that Christianity mm-hmm. has. Is it fair to make? I don't think I'm twisting it too hard to say there, no. there's sort of a parallel here of saying is the vision of environmental progress a pipe dream? Well, no, largely not. Humans have the capacity to make a lot of changes and do a lot of really great stuff. But you have to make that and honoring the complexity of the system and in a way that isn't destroying the livelihoods. And mm-hmm. it's it's complicated, right? So same thing. Yep. Is it possible for Christians to cast a vision of what is possible? Um, or is that uh, is, help me out? There's a parable yeah. train, a parallel train of thought here that seems to to exist. Well, just purely from a psychological standpoint, which vision is going to be more helpful in your behavior? A vision of the future that is apocalyptic or a vision of the future that is filled with hope and great expectations? So now I understand that Christianity is an apocalyptic vision in the sense of unveiling and the sense, but Christianity is well, it, a, no, let's let's parse that out because the terminology yeah. there is very important. When we say apocalypse, we're talking about the revelation of the fullness of what God has planned. Right. That's that's mm-hmm. very different from the way that culturally we use apocalypse as like here come the zombies the and everything. everything's radioactive. Destruction. Yeah. This yeah. total destruction, meltdown. So just purely from a psychological standpoint. If you're being motivated by a vision of total destruction and meltdown, then the primary engine for your for your <laughs> behavior, for your thinking is fear. Very serious fear and urgency. And I have a lot of sympathy because again, if you step outside of Christianity, the options become a whole lot more limited. And the world, if to a certain mindset, the world appears to be completely on your shoulders or on the shoulders of humanity. Okay, that's a pretty overwhelming thought, right? (laughs) So, but if on the other hand, your vision is undergirded by an ultimate sense of hope in the goodness, control, and mercy, and compassion of a God who made everything in the first place and said it was good, then you've got a degree of 
peace and stability, even when things do go wrong, even so you can look the crisis in the eyes, so to speak, and say, yeah, this is indeed a crisis, but it doesn't have the final say. So you actually, you've got the mental space, you have the room cleared out to do some constructive thinking that's not motivated by panic and by fear, a sense of urgency, certain, certainly degrees of fear, all human beings feel fear, but your ultimate hope is secure. And I think in that sense, Christianity makes room for a more realistic vision of mm -hmm. justice where you don't have to revert to extreme measures and stunts like that because ultimately the world is not on your shoulders. It's not in your hands. You play a part. You are, abs you are a steward and you are part of, I mean, creation care is part of your mandate. I know that's a phrase that sets some people's teeth on edge, but it is part of the mandate, but the world is not in your hands, so to speak. And I think that frees you a great deal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's real responsibility, but it's couched in a moral vision that gives us real a real sense of oughtness for our action and a viable alternative and motivation for for living. So um, I think the 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 concluding thought there for me then is you you know we can kind of look at some of the protests and say you know what that's not really going anywhere. Uh, largely, it's had a negative result as far as people aren't super impressed by that. And the means by which you're doing it do not encourage people toward the vision that you have. And so that opens up the door there for us as Christians to make sure that the thing that we're doing is not destructive, that we're not metaphorically gluing ourselves to things and just making a stink and destroying things and being a thorn in people's flesh just for the sake of being culturally different, but that we really are casting a vision of beauty and a possibility and potential and calling people into that. So, um, there you go. It's not a protest. It's a possibility, uh, I guess. So anyway, yeah, Cameron, wrap it up for us. Yeah, no, I think I just keep smiling because I keep thinking of somebody who's in this category who has managed to put one of these stunts onto a resume and what that would sound like. <laughs> Successfully managed to glue myself to a Rubens at the Met in New York City. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why that keeps popping into my head. But yeah. I had to end on a lighthearted note there. So I hope this has been helpful to you. We are deeply grateful for you listening. Hey, you guys are getting a whole lot more talkative and we like it. You're writing us emails. You're asking us questions. You're setting us straight. Keep them coming. We like it. A reminder here, I am planning to update our socials here pretty soon, but we've got an event coming up in the Atlanta area. It is a regional event. It's our fundraiser. but you will also get a chance to hear from Nathan Rittenhouse himself, and you'll hear from me also. And one Stuart McAllister shall be there as well. We're talking about the, really, we're, we're going to talk about what we do, why we do what we do at Thinking Out Loud, and we'd love you to be a part of that. But if you're, so if you're in the Atlanta area, or if you want to make a road trip, you can do so. Hitchhike. We would love to see you there. Yeah. <laughs> Hitchhike. <laughs> Please be safe. But yeah, we would love to see you there. You have been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.